All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the stream. Hope everybody is doing well. We are going to uh, do something a little bit, um, a little bit different tonight. Uh, so we'll get into that here in a minute. But um, before I do and before I kick off the stream, I do just want to take a quick second and thank the supporters of the channel, starting with the partners who are the highest tier of subscription over on YouTube memberships and Patreon. They are Gabby Bashir and Gerbolis Inc. I'd also like to thank all the other supporters listed here on the screen. Uh, they are the other tiers of support over on Patreon and YouTube memberships, as well as Twitch subscriptions. So thank you all very much for your support. I greatly appreciate it. Of course, that goes without saying that, or I hope it goes without saying at least, that I support. Uh, I, I greatly appreciate the support of uh, all the viewers, whether you're here on the YouTube side or on the Twitch side. We do simulcast, so uh, I thank you guys very much for supporting me just by being here, hanging out, uh, and whatnot. That being said, this is an interactive stream, so if you guys have questions along the way, um, things you want to discuss, feel free to bring them up in chat. I do keep an eye on it. I may not get to it immediately, uh, but I do read them, right? Okay, so with all of that stuff out of the way, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, something I've been needing to do for quite a while, actually. Um, and this has been something I've mentioned a few times in the stream uh, that's been bothering me for a while. And uh, I decided now was a good time to uh, sort of get it out of the way. And that is uh, a little bit of code reorganization. So. Um, we had sort of a, uh, a very sort of ad hoc naming convention for all of our libraries. Uh, there were things in places where they shouldn't be. Um, and uh, adding the timeline system uh, last time sort of kind of started making me um, more and more aware of it. Um, and it was something I needed to fix before I added too many more systems. So... Um, what we're basically doing right now is we're in the middle of uh, basically just moving a bunch of stuff around. Um, there is some minor refactoring that we're doing as well in terms of um, how some of this stuff works. Um, and we're going to be adding and removing some things, cleaning up some stuff, um, and doing, you know, just general maintenance uh, on the code base as a whole. So that is the plan for tonight. Um, I'm hoping we make decent progress with it. I've actually done quite a lot offline already. Um, and so uh, we can briefly step through that um, and, uh, and then we'll go ahead and, um, and get back to kind of where I left off, which is where to have uh, the note right here, right? So um, at the moment, uh, part of the reason for this was, like I said, there, were, uh, there wasn't really a clear separation of, um, of some of the core components and where those were. And so um, we now have a structure that looks a little bit something like this. Um, so uh, you'll note that we also have uh, a couple of different, uh, some things have been renamed in, in, um, in a manner where it, it makes a little bit more sense. You probably already know what they are. And then there's some other things that it's like, well, what's that? So uh, for the most part, um, just about everything actually has uh, a Kohi prefix on it now. Um, and what that will also do is uh, when, when we actually build the assemblies, um, it will make those assemblies named uh, the same thing as these are, right? So um, the most important set of changes is uh, this concept of core and this concept of runtime. So runtime essentially is what the engine was before. So we had just sort of an engine library, um, and now uh, that has been moved to Kohi runtime. But a lot of things have been split from engine into core. So uh, we now have a Kohi.core and a Kohi runtime. And so what is the difference between these two? Well, you've heard me talk a little bit about um, a foundation layer. Um, and uh, it would basically, you know, it was basically something that um, gave us all of our basic types, some of our containers, things of that nature, um, where we could use those things and not necessarily have to reference the entire um, Kohi engine code base. And so that's essentially what the split is. Um, so uh, essentially, what we what we have now is we have this core library, um, and it has our containers, our math, our basic memory functions, parsers our platform layers, threading stuff, which kind of falls under platform a little bit. We might move some of this stuff around. Some of our utility functions, um, 
some core other things like identifiers, uh, our defines, our input types, but not input, just input types. So that's key, key, uh, key codes, um, mouse buttons, things like that. Um, our certs, our clock, our handle, um, our memory functions, our mutex, semaphores, um, our string library, our threads, uh, our logger, and our UUID. And so uh, these are all things that we may need uh, external to the engine for some of our tools. And that was the primary reason for splitting these out is because we are going to have a situation here very shortly where we're going to need to reference these things, but we don't necessarily need to import uh, the entire uh, engine, which is now runtime, right? So uh, our runtime has uh, things like our audio. Um, it has things like our console, our core engine class, uh, our, um, our event, uh, our event system, our input system, um, our K-bar system, metrics, things of that nature. Um, it still contains like our graphs. Uh, it still contains our renderer front end. Um, uh, it still contains our resource layer, uh, our various systems. Um, and for now, some of the vendor libraries, right? Uh, that's going to be changing as well. And so um, the separation here is, is uh, the core is basically uh, functionality that could be used outside of the engine or its, uh, or its runtime. So uh, things that we may be able to use outside of uh, an editor or uh, things that we might be able to use outside of um, our, uh, our end games, right? Um, and so this would be things that we would use to also write our tooling with. And so um, those kind of things are in core. Um, and then the other things that are used uh, in our applications, such as our editor um, and such as our end games are in runtime. So this separation, I think, is just a little bit cleaner. Um, I'm not 100% finished making it yet. There may be some things that move back and forth, uh, but that is basically the split there. All right, uh, before we continue, let me just uh, catch up on some chats here. Um, I was official over on the Twitch side. Hello, welcome, how are you doing? Good to see you. Uh, let's see, um, Michael J, uh, or is it, is that called, is that Michael or is it Mich Michal? I'm not 100% sure. It looks like Michael, but I realize it's missing an E in there. So <laughs> I might be mispronouncing that, but how are you doing? Um, Tomas, good to see you. Uh, hi, I have a question about your beard. Do you plan to shave it when Kohi is done? So it's funny you bring that up, actually. Um, so my uh, I hadn't really planned one way or another, right? I might just might just cut it all off if I get if I get like really annoyed by it. But um, I was thinking like if my YouTube channel winds up hitting 100,000 subscribers before the end of the year, which I don't think is ever going to happen, but if it does, I'll take all of this off and I'll cut this short. Right? <laughs> I don't think it's ever going to happen, but that's the plan. Spread the word. <laughs> More or less. All right. Um, so... Let's see, okay, so we covered core, we covered runtime. Um, we're also gonna wind up having uh, some tests that go along with these things. Now, everything is under runtime tests right now. We're gonna wind up eventually having a core tests, um, and we're gonna basically be running those um, against a sort of centralized uh, test library, right? So we're gonna split that out as well. And eventually these things are, um, a lot of these things are going to be plugins that are going to be uh, modularly pulled in, right? And so we want a, a nice clean separation between all these things, and that's that's kind of what we're working towards now. So uh, we still have this Kohi Tools, um, which is sort of just a, um, it doesn't really actually contain anything now. The tool that we did have in there, we stripped out, but we are going to be adding uh, something to that. So we've left it here because it's kind of a, an already scaffolded project that we can build on top of. Um, and use it as a template for other tools. Um, we've moved our version generator um, over to its own uh, kohi.tools sort of namespace, if you will. Um, so there's that. And then uh, our plugins. Uh, so now we, we follow this naming scheme of kohi.plugin. Um, 
and then what kind of plugin it is. So an audio plugin, a renderer plugin, or a UI plugin. And then the specific uh, implementation, right? So in this case, uh, this is an audio.openal uh, plugin. This is a Vulkan renderer plugin. This is a standard UI plugin, right? Um, and eventually we'll have other versions of these things, like we'll have a kohi.plugin.renderer.direct3d or a kohi.plugin.ui.immediate or something like that, right? Um, as we, we generate those different things. Um, oh, it's more pronounced me how. Okay, I was completely off, by the way. All right. Um, so uh, that's kind of the plan for those. Those have already largely been um, taken care of, right? So those should be good. Uh, most of our work is going to be around runtime and core and getting those things split up. Uh, that being said, uh, the other change that we've made is uh, our test bed right now um, now has uh, two different things that are called test bed, right? So there's the K app and the K lib, right? And this is the um, more or less the pattern we're going to follow for our applications. So our applications uh, are going to have a K app um, sort of name and our test bed or, or our uh, application library is going to be K lib. And the reason I put the K in front of that is because um, on some platforms, you can't just have .app or .lib. Um, I, knew, I know Mac OS threw a huge hissy fit if I just had the folder named testbed.app. Even though there was stuff in it, it still didn't like it. So uh, to get around that, um, I decided it would be safe to just do it this way. All right. Um, so uh, those are some of the surface level changes. Um, now, in terms of uh, a little bit lower level stuff, um, there's already some things that I've done um, in terms of like even just moving stuff around, right? So uh, change, and there's already some stuff that I've done in terms of, whoops, that's the wrong one. Uh, I want this one. Uh, there's also some uh, some refactoring that I've already done uh, sort of off camera. So project's been restructured, that's obvious. Um, so we expanded the KVAR system because I had to move a bunch of stuff around having to do with the KVAR system. So our KVAR system um, now includes floats and strings, right? So that's that global sort of console variable system that we have. Um, and that's also got a slew of new uh, console commands to go with that as well. Um, so we may step through that, maybe not. I don't know how valuable that would be. Um, really, it's just adding types to what we already had. But I did move around a lot of stuff in there um, and just cleaned it up a bit. Um, I also simplified uh, the system so that we no longer have a, uh, a create KVAR and a set KVAR. It's just set now. And if it doesn't exist, it creates it, right? Um, so uh, that uh, makes a lot more sense too. I also um, added uh, a description field to each of the KVARs. Uh, it's not currently implemented, uh, but eventually you'll be able to put in a, a small text description um, for each of the fields. And then when you do a print all um, KVARs, then uh, that description will actually show up, right? Um, so we still have to actually uh, do some work to get that in, but that wasn't huge priority. So I kind of just put a pin in it um, so that we can move on. Um, I fixed a couple bugs with the string API. Uh, there were a couple of the functions that we added recently um, where we were converting um, ants, floats, and bools to string. That was also requiring a string property that wasn't actually being used. Um, that was a copy pasta issue, so I fixed that. And then um, I actually optimized the logger to prepend the log level strings and append new lines at compile time instead of runtime. So what do I mean by that? So if we take a look, um, here we go. So if we take a look, uh, let's look at, at Fatal, for example, right? The signature of, of this macro didn't change, right? So we still, we still have that. Um, it still takes a message, um, and then it takes, uh, you know, the, uh, the ellipsis for however many properties, right? But then if we look at the call to uh, log output, we still see that we, we pass the, uh, the log level to it. But then uh, we go ahead and we put the, uh, the prepended text, so fatal or error or warn or what have you. We put that first 
then we put the message, then we put the new line, right? And so in C, it is perfectly valid to, to do this, right? Um, and in C++, you might think you have to do something like this to add, you know, to concatenate the strings. You don't actually have to. You can put them right next to each other um, and they become uh, concatenated, right? And so the beauty of this is uh, we can actually use that to our advantage to uh, apply these things at, uh, at compile time instead of um, doing an additional level of format. So if we go in here to the log outputs function, uh, let's see, logger C. If we take a look at this guy, he's a lot shorter, right? So now what we have is just our sort of huge um, message block here. And then we have a single string format V uh, where we use the uh, var variadic uh, arguments um, to parse that out. There's one of those done instead of having to have two to also prepend uh, the log level on there, right? So we do that um, and then we pass it on to um, either what's called a console hook, which is a new thing, or um, the platform console write. So um, the second part of this is uh, this concept of console hook. So if we take a look at our runtime, right? And this is actually still under core. Our runtime is where console is, right? So that's uh, where we have the console and the consumers um, where we can write a line to the console and then it spits that same line out to all of its consumers and so forth. And we weren't really using that to uh, the best of its ability, right? So uh, we have that, uh, that's in the runtime, right? Because you don't really need that for your tooling or anything like that. That's really a runtime type of thing. Um, but if we look in core, core is actually where our logger is, right? So core doesn't know anything about the runtime and nor should it, right? The runtime references core, core does not reference runtime. So before what this was doing was, uh, this was basically just passing off to the console directly. And the logger really shouldn't know anything about the console. It might, it might know about maybe an entry point into a thing that could be a console, right? Uh, but it shouldn't know about it directly, right? And so what we have is this concept of a console hook. And the console hook is a function pointer, right? So if we take a look at this, it's a function pointer that um, declares log level and a formatted message, right? And so what we do is we have a new logger console write hook set, right? And so uh, we pass in the function pointer, which is the hook, and we just set this static console hook to that. So when we come down here to log output, we say, hey, if we have this hook, go ahead and pass this to the hook. Um, and it's assumed at that point that the hook will then pass it to the platform layer, which is what writes it out to our actual terminal, right? If we don't have that, then we just pass it off to the platform layer, which is also located in core, right? So that's here, right? And so uh, the benefit of that is, uh, since all that stuff is in the core, um, the, uh, the platform layer is easily reachable and we don't have to have anything else in place for an external library um, to be able to use Kohi Core. So when we go to set up some of our, um, our, tool, um, our tooling, right, which is gonna be um, additional executables and things like that, um, we can go ahead and use the non-hook version of this and get away with it, right? And it's, it's very easy. Essentially, if we don't call this, this right hook set, we just fall back to default functionality, right? Otherwise, um, we go ahead and pass it off to whatever hook is registered, right? And that also provides us with the flexibility of um, if we have another system uh, that's external to the system, to the engine or something that we want to hook into it later, we also can do that. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Uh, let's see. Do you have your Vim config somewhere? Um, what theme do you use? Yes, I do have it. So uh, I will drop a link in both chats, actually. Assuming my bot picks that up. It can be a little slow in the uptake sometimes. There it goes. Yeah, so if you follow that link, you'll get uh, to a article that I wrote 
um, that is uh, explaining my uh, NeoVim setup. And then there's a link in there uh, to the actual configuration. Let's see, maybe set the initial value of console hook to platform console rights or wrapper adjusting arguments. So they actually have, and I thought about doing that, but they actually have a different function signature, right? So platform console right actually takes a handle to the platform, right? Um, which I don't have at this layer, right? So um, that's really for like preference saving and things like that. So I can pass null here, um, which is what I'm doing here. But if the engine calls it, the engine will actually have that, right? Um, so when the console that this hook passes off to calls that, it will actually pass a different variable here. So the function signature is a little bit different. That's why I didn't do that. Um, let's see. and make hook set return previous value of console hook. So, I mean, I could do that, but I don't think it's really valuable, right? It can only be set once. I'm not gonna allow multiple hooks, at least not for now. Um, so I don't think there's a whole lot of value in that necessarily. Um, it would let the caller revert any temporary changes to console hooks. So it's not really it's not really something that's designed to be like hooked and unhooked repeatedly, right? It's something that's designed to like hook into it once at boot up and that's pretty much it. Um, I suppose we could enhance it to do that, but I don't I don't think we're gonna need that. Because the thing is is um, our console system is going to be responsible for actually outputting to all the various systems that we need to output to. And I'll actually go over that now. Um, actually, as soon as I look at the uh, at the Twitch side. All right, RCW, good to see you. Excited to see the changes, awesome. Um, should line 37 be zero level out message? You're right, thank you for that. That would have been a tricky bug that I wouldn't have caught right away. Good call. Magets, good to see you. How's it going? Welcome, welcome. Okay, so, um, yeah, this is, this is like one of a bunch of changes that I've made, so I would not be surprised if I've broken some stuff. <clears throat> <laughs> the buffer size gives you anxiety. It should be 32768. I mean, I could do, but the reason I didn't um, Did that leave that buffer open? Yeah, it did. Um What was that? It's also here. So, I mean, I, I probably should not have a magic number there. I should probably have like a define or something, but honestly, if you're doing anything larger than that, even if you're doing anything close to that, I have questions. Like at that point, you really should be chunking it up. And I might put some safeties in there to do some checks against that, maybe. Okay, so the other thing that you'll notice in here is there is a distinct lack of a console.log in here. Um, and the reason for that is because that, that functionality has been offloaded. So the engine is one of the other huge uh, changes that we're making. So um, let's actually just go here to the top. Because you have broken all kinds of crap, right? <clears throat> so, uh, one of the other things that I'm doing is I am moving all of the system initialization back to the engine. Um, I had set up a, uh, a sort of, where is it? Uh, not in the core. In the runtime, I had set up this systems manager 
to do a lot of this stuff for us. But Amenta had to do lots of weird void pointer, um, you know, hackery to get around types and stuff um, and deal with interfaces, right? Um, and I just, I really didn't like the way that it was sort of abstracting a lot of stuff and making some of this stuff a little bit hard to understand and hard to find and hard to follow. And so um, what I've done is I've just opted to go back for the simple um, initialization routine that we actually kind of started with, right? Which is not really that, that large of a change. It's just kind of converting stuff from doing the systems manager way of doing it back to what we had before. So uh, more or less, um, what we're doing now is we are initializing all of the various systems from uh, engine create now. And so, um, you know, we have our platform system startup, our console system here. Um, and so uh, what we do is actually, technically speaking, the memory, the memory system is first, right? And that was here from before. So the memory system is first. Then we set up the, uh, the platform layer, right? So nothing's much, much has changed there. Um, and then the console system is set up, right? So we do our console, console initialize, right? Um, stand up our states, pass it back, the whole double call thing that we've done a bunch of times. And um, this is where we actually set up our console consumers. So we set up two new console consumers. Um, so we register one, which is uh, the platform layer itself, right? Um, and so uh, that is essentially saying, okay, let's take uh, any anytime the console has uh, anything written to it, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, forward that off to the platform layer so that it can write it out to the console um, or, you know, the terminal, right? And then we're going to go ahead and uh, we're also going to keep a log file handle at the engine level at this point, right? Because that's really an engine level config, right? The logging system has no business holding onto that. Um, and so what we're going to do is we open up a file handle to a console.log here, and then we set up another console consumer which is the engine uh, log file write. And so the engine is now responsible for passing those um, to the platform layer and to the file um, um, individually, right? Um, so it sets up those, um, those console consumers, registers them, and then um, any time from this time forward that anything is written to the console, uh, it is automatically passed to those two. The advantage to doing it this way is uh, we are going to eventually have uh, other console consumers that are going to exist as well, such as like writing out to TTY or writing out to, uh, um, you know, maybe a WebSocket or something like that, right? Um, where we can have some sort of networked uh, log capture system in place um, where we can then throw those logs into a database and maybe, uh, you know, run some sort of uh, analytics on that uh, in the future. And so um, all we'll have to do for that is again, just plug it in as a console consumer right here at the very beginning and we'll be good to go. We can also theoretically make this uh, configurable in app config if we do it here. So um, that's one of the reasons that we're kind of doing that, right? All right, um, so we've got that. Um, Obviously here we report the um, the engine version, which is now just gonna be the runtime version, right? So we'll report that. Um, here's our KVAR system. So we just initialize that event system. Um, so after we uh, initialize the event system, we actually hook up some of our platform um, events, right? So um, this is another big change that we've made uh, to the platform is there's a, there's a few things in here that uh, are brand new. One of those is um, the concept of window closed and window resized. Uh, we didn't really have the concept of a window um, really in the engine, right? It was sort of abstracted off to the platform layer and forgotten about. And that's another change that we're gonna make, right? Is uh, we're actually gonna have a concept of like a K window that we can then um, you know, perform operations on, set the title, resize it, um, things of that nature. And so now um, our engine will actually receive uh, close and resize events based on a particular window, right? So uh, that's some logic that we're gonna have to fill out. Uh, the renderer is also going to be made aware of when a new window is created um, because we'll need to create a new surface, new swap change, things like that for uh, a new window. 
So all of this uh, is a first step towards actually supporting multiple windows um, in our engine so that we can actually draw to multiple windows at once, right? That'll be uh, useful for debug views and things like that, I think. Um, and so that's the first step towards that. It looks like we're gonna have ads here for a second. So um, I like to break the, or uh, pause the stream when ads come up. Um, on the Twitch side, it's once every 30 minutes for 90 seconds. Um, and so I just pause the stream whenever ads come up so that nobody misses anything. So those will be here momentarily, right now in fact. And we'll be back in 90 seconds. Oh, I forgot to fix my timer. Dang it. That says an hour and 29 minutes. It is not an hour and a half. It is a minute and a half. I forgot to fix that. Dang it. I thought I got everything. All right. So we got about um, 30 seconds on ads left. Not an hour and a half, about 30 seconds. <laughs> I may have to fix that on stream because that's going to drive me nuts. I might fix it. I might attempt to fix it on the next ad break. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, Supe, it's not it's not actually 1.5 hours of ads. It's really about 10 seconds left. All right, yeah. So, uh that we are back. That ad timer is obviously wrong. Get that ad money, right? <laughs> 1.5 hours of ads. Dude, ad re revenue would be insane. Uh, Supe, thank you for the um, the raid, by the way. I appreciate that, buddy. How are you doing? Uh, Lino, how's it going? First time chat, welcome. And then your ads start. You might be getting pre-rolls. It's entirely possible. All right, so... Where were we? Um, so we were talking about a little bit about um, engine windows, right? Um, or, or the concept of a window, right? So we're we're going to, I mean, windows still exist at the platform layer. The, the platform layer is still what spawns a window, um, but we are going to have sort of an opaque handle to those windows now um, so that we can perform various operations against them. And then we're also going to associate that with um, uh, some of our render work that we're doing, right? So um, we we do have a little bit of work to do around that as well. Um, input system is pretty pretty much the same as well. Uh, we just register some input hooks. So um, input is another one of those things that was tightly coupled to the platform, similar to um, window resizes and file watchers, right? Um, all these things were um, tied into the event system. And the event system is something that is in the runtime, not in the core, because the core really doesn't need an event system, right? And so I had to remove all those references uh, to events from the platform layer. So the way to get around that was to install hooks um, into, or callbacks into the platform layer um, that could then be passed on to uh, the engine if and when they are actually set. So we have some of those here and then some of those here. Right, um, and so basically, whenever we we uh, will need to add other methods of input, we'll just have to add a couple more hooks, which is not a big deal. Okay. Uh, hello from Morocco. Awesome. Good to see you. Uh, let's see. You can replace the thirty-two thousand literal with size of out message. Yeah, but out message is the output buffer, right? So it has to be, um, it has to be big enough to actually handle how much text is being written to it, right? So the issue is there is I don't know what that number is going to be in advance, and I don't want to do the string format twice. 
because uh, that would be way slower than just having a huge block of memory that I can just write to, right? If that makes sense. All right, um, so uh, our resource system is stood up, right? Uh, I have some notes in here about um, the application should be configuring some of it. The shader system, the renderer system, the job system, and I think this is as far as I got offline. Oh, and the audio system. So all these things are stood up, right? But what what we did have this concept of in the systems manager, we, see, we had this concept of, uh, let's see. Supe, thank you for gifting a tier one sub. Appreciate that. Thank you, buddy. I owe you a shout out, by the way. Because, for those of you who don't know, uh, Supe is a good buddy of mine, and he's starting his own channel on Twitch, his own stream. And so I would encourage you to go follow him. He's an interesting dude to listen to talk. He, he's always come up with like off the wall stuff. He's, he's very hilarious. He's deep, deeply funny. No, I know Supe, but yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate you, my dude. All right. Um, so, uh, what we had before was this, this concept of sort of a pre-boot or a pre-application boot and a, and a post-application boot, right? Um, and basically what that was, was the application boot sequence is where the application configuration gets loaded up. And we have certain configuration items that we then fed to the engine. And the engine was set up in such a way where uh, that application configuration was needed at startup um, during the boot sequence um, in order to actually stand some of these systems up. So the systems that actually require that stuff, um, we're going to refactor those to no longer require that. And what we're going to do is we're going to set those things up so that they have a sort of uh, pre-boot and post-boot uh sort of set up on their own, right? So the initial, the system initialization won't do anything uh, that requires, uh, you know, the post boot stage uh, to be true. And so that keeps, that's going to keep all of our system initialization in one place, um, very linear, um, very uh, easy to determine what is going on. And then once we actually boot the application, we'll say, okay, um, toss this application or the, this, uh, this application config off to all the systems and any of them that need to do additional work post boot can do that, right? And so that's kind of the uh, the idea there. Uh, let's see. Uh, thank you for the follows, by the way. I appreciate that. All right. So I hope that makes sense. Um, so basically, I got to the point where um, we. This was kind of where in the sequence of events that the game boot happens um, in time, right? So I put a big old comment here um, to denote that. And there's uh, basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take all these systems here that have been brought over from um, the systems manager and I'm going to uh, move those above this line uh, one by one. And then any of those that need additional work to happen post boot, that will happen, uh, let's see down here. So here's the game's boot sequence, right? So let's just right, we'll just put a big old divider right there. And so um, this will essentially tell us, uh, you know, um, at this point that the application's configuration has been loaded. And then we can go ahead and do those post uh, boot items after that, right? So um, right now they are all above this line. Um, I think I can actually just nuke this line. Um, and we should be good to go. Now, um, there are a couple of notes that I have in here uh, and this really should be a to do. So one thing that we need to do now is we have this, this uh, concept of a window creation, right? Um, of manually creating a window, right? Which was sort of automatically done for us before. So now we're actually gonna have to reach into the platform at some point and um, create a new window. Um, now, my thought behind this is we probably don't wanna do this until uh, the actual um, boot of the application is complete, right? The initial boot sequence of the application. So uh, I'm actually gonna move that here 
right? And uh, we'll sort of handle uh, handle that there. Uh, we'll also say another to do um, handle post boots items in systems that require app config app config right um, and that'll sort of uh, cover both of our our bases for us All right so um, That leaves us X form, which shouldn't require anything, right? Um, maybe we have this initial slot count. Maybe. I don't think we necessarily need that. Um, in fact, we can get rid of that um, because that's just an initial count, right? It can expand from there. So it doesn't really, doesn't really need that, right? Um, this also has a to do exposed to app config. Um, and this might be for like creating default type line, type time lines. I don't think we need that either, right? Um, so if we do need something done post boot, we can always add it later. Um, the other thing that I'm doing to sort of visually split these up in the code is I'm sort of just um, putting scopes around all these guys, right? So, right, so one there, one here. Here's the texture system, the font system. Uh, let's see, it's down, okay. All right, um, and so uh, the font system is one of those systems uh, I know for a fact that we're actually gonna have to change, right? Uh, because uh, it has a concept of default fonts, um, which in fact comes from the app config right here, right? Um, and so uh, that step shouldn't happen until uh, the application is actually booted, right? We don't need to do that ahead of time. Um, that was just kind of left over some, from some code that we kind of slammed into place when we first set that system up and we don't necessarily need to do that anymore. From Lake, good to see you. How's it going? All right. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna scope these off, and then there's gonna be some changes that we have to make for each uh, each one of these. Um, okay, so just a couple more. All right, so there's one there. Right. So we've got that, um, and now. You'll notice that uh, I've uh, I've converted some of these, right? So um, I think everything up to audio system, um, where I just call their um, their initialize, right? Uh, and then the ones that haven't been converted over to the sort of old or classic way of doing things, um, still use this systems manager register, which is not what we want to use. So uh, what we need to do for each one of these is we need an X form memory requirement. So, uh, let's see. Uh, we need the edge and state, right? And so we're, we're adding sort of all these things back up here. Uh, and the advantage of doing it this way is we have strongly typed stuff everywhere, right? So we can say U64, um, XForm, system memory requirements. Uh, struct x form system state um, x form. I'm going to say x form system. I think I'm going to wind up renaming some of these things. Right? So we'll go back to down here and we'll say x form. Uh, system initialize and to that we are going to pass uh, the address of engine state uh, x form system memory requirement we're going to pass zero for the memory block and uh, I guess we could pass the config right so we'll pass the address of um, x form sys config right 
and then we'll do a um, engine state xform system equals k allocate. Um, and to that, we are going to pass the engine state xform system memory requirements. Um, and then we're going to tag that with uh, mem tag engine. And then we're going to take this guy and go in here and replace this with that, right? Passing uh, engine state, engine state, um, x form system right there. And then we'll say initialize fail to initialize X form system if that fails, right? And so uh, this is what a converted one of those looks like, right? Okay, so um, we don't have that many systems to get through. Uh, it looks like I already did it for timeline. Um, so we just need a texture system, font system, material system, geometry, light, and camera system. All right, so not a huge deal. Uh, so I think texture system was their next one, right? Yeah. All right, so um, max texture count. I don't really think we're going to need that many textures, but sure, why not? Texture. Oh, you know what? Before I can do that, uh, you know what? Let's actually do, I'm going to copy this stuff real quick, just so I have a, a list of all the systems I need to create this stuff for. So we can do this first so we can stop bouncing around between um, the bottom and the top here. All right, um, whoops. Don't need that, don't need that. Um, okay, so all right, so we can do, in fact, I'm just going to copy this real quick. Uh, let's see, how do we want to do this? Uh, you know what? I'm just going to paste a copy of this for each one of these and we'll just rename them along the way. All right, so this is texture system memory requirements, texture system states, texture system. Uh, it's gonna be, whoops, font system memory requirement, font system states, font system. Material system memory requirements. Material system states. Material. One thing I'm aiming for with this also is consistency, right? So some of these things aren't necessarily named this way. Um, so we want to fix that as well. All right. Um, so this is going to be light system, right? And then camera system. Right. And then we can Do that. And let's see, let's get back down here to texture system. So now we can just say texture 
uh, system initialize. Uh, and this is going to take uh, the address of engine state uh, texture system memory requirement, rather. I'm going to pass zero for the state itself because we're just getting the size, and then we'll pass the address of texture uh, sys config. All right, um, we'll just do copy post of that texture system, texture system memory requirements. Uh, we'll tag it with the engine, and then we will take this guy, paste it there, and then fail to initialize texture system. Okay. Uh, so we've got that. I'm going to move everything to preboot and get rid of these notes as well. So removing all that stuff. Uh, font system is going to be the same thing. Um, now, we have a font config here. Uh, let's see, our app config is actually going to be game inst. Oops. App config. Dot font config. All right, but we have, actually, I don't think we actually want to use that. So, oh, I was like, why isn't this? Okay, so um, this is gonna be something we wanna use uh, post boot, right? So let's do, let's take this and let's go down here. I know this is this is one that definitely is going to need doing. Right? So we'll do that. Um, and we'll just basically start up the font system without any sort of config. Um, so in this case, uh, we're going to do a font system initialize. Uh, we're going to pass the address of engine state uh, font system memory requirement and we're going to pass zero for both the memory block and the config um, then we'll do copy of this guy font system memory requirement um, and we are also not going to pass a config here Right, so oh, this is, uh, wait a minute. I copied the wrong line. I wanted this one. I thought something looked off. Uh, this should be font system. Font system memory requirement, tag engine. And then take this, place that. Um, and we're gonna say instead of register, we'll do that. Daddy Biffles, how's it going? Good to see you. It's the man. All right, so, um, that's our font system. Like I said, for now, we're not gonna use a config because the config is actually post boot items. Um, I guess I can take this and move it down. All right. All right, we'll just kind of keep a running tally of those there. Um, all 
right, so that's the font system. Material system is next. We do have a basic kind of config for that. Um, let's initialize that to zero. Uh, and then we'll do uh, material system uh, initialize. And we're going to pass the address of engine state material system memory requirement. Uh, and then we'll pass zero for um, zero for the states, and then we'll pass the address of material sysconfig, right? And then we'll grab this guy, material system, material system memory requirements, and then we'll go here, grab this, replace that guy and here we will pass engine states material system which uh, i just realized i didn't do that up here for the font system or the texture system oops uh, this is font system Uh, yeah, okay, I did it there. All right, so engine state uh, texture system, right? So we've got that geometry system config. It's going to be um, kind of the same deal. All right, we'll initialize that to zero. Then we'll do uh, geometry system initialize address of engine states, uh, geometry system memory requirements, and then pass uh, zero for the states and then the address of geometry assist config. Right, grab this. Right, change geometry system and geometry system memory requirements then grab this place that and we'll do uh, engine states geometry system right um, and then we'll do initialize this needs to be initialized and I think I might have missed it for no I think I got these ones okay cool all right, so uh, that's that geometry system. I think all we have is lighted is lighting camera, right? Which mm, light system does not have any configurations, so that one will be pretty quick. Um, so we'll do uh, light system initialize. Pass it the address of engine state. Light system memory requirements zero for the memory, zero for the config. Um, grab a copy of this guy, light system, light system memory requirements, grab this, replace that, and do engine states light system. All right, so uh, we got that. Did I forget these? Yeah, I forgot these notes. Let's delete these. Don't need these guys anymore. All right, so we've got that. All right, so now camera system is the last one we need to do. Um, do you use Clang D? Yes, I do. Yep. Um, which is, yeah, that's where I'm getting all my um, IntelliSense and stuff like that from. Which actually, I just realized I had my Source Explorer still open. I don't need that. All right. Uh, so here is the 
last system. So here's the configuration. Let's go ahead and just zero that out to be safe. And then we have camera, system initialize, address of engine state, camera system memory requirements, pass zero for the state and pass the cam sys config address there. Um, take a copy of this, put that here. Camera system adds. Always good timing. So I know over on the YouTube side, you guys don't get ads quite like the uh, Twitch side does, but um, I like to pause the stream anyways, just to make sure that nobody misses anything. Um. Typing something to lure YouTube viewers, the bigger you get on Twitch, the quieter YouTube chat seems to get. It, it's on and off, really. Like, sometimes YouTube chat, like, really blows up, and other times it's just super quiet, right? Uh, and by the way, it is not an hour and a half for ads. I meant to fix that, didn't I? Well, I can't do it in 30 seconds, so I'll have to I'll have to get it on the next try. Got about uh, 15 seconds left on ads. Code's looking very sharp. Thanks, appreciate that. All right, and ads are dead. Cool. Um, I <laughs> can't do it in 30 seconds, not with that attitude. Yeah, exactly, right? Um, well, okay. I just don't want to risk taking down OBS <laughs> and or the stream, right? I guess that's, that's really what it is. Uh, do you write out the design? Do I write out the design of like the engine overall? Is that what you mean? Oops. Yes, do you document the engine design? Briefly, right? Um, because I know with something as complex as a game engine, uh, that design is going to change a lot. So. I don't spend a lot of time like trying to UML things or, or diagram things. Um, I much prefer to um, design via discovery, although I have a lot of the design in my head of how it's going to come together just from having done it so many times. That being said, um, I am going to uh, add a little bit more documentation in terms of the actual design that we're, we're uh, going towards now, because this is a design that I've been wanting to go to for quite a while. Um, and so I am going to wind up documenting this one. Um, part of the reason I haven't documented this stuff too is because this started off as a tutorial series. Um, and when you're making a tutorial, you can't really, you can't do everything as you normally would for an end release product right off the bat, right? Cause you have a lot of, um, a lot of setup stuff that has to happen before you can even start writing code in that case, right? Um, and so, uh, I didn't want to kind of get into a situation where I was just had videos upon videos of just that stuff before we even started actually writing stuff. Right. And it wouldn't give me the flexibility to try different things. So, um, you know, we've changed formats, video formats a couple of times. Um, we've tried some experimental features in here, some of which have been backed out. Um, I'm actually backing out another feature tonight, um, just cause I didn't like the way it came together. Right. Um, and so the design is going to change. Um, but that being said, it, with all of the experimentation we've done where we've kind of moved things around and, and tried different stuff, this is actually taking things a step back towards the original design that I had towards the very beginning, um, which was what I kind of wanted to keep in the first place. So I, I hope that makes sense. Um, Saladin, 
I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, first time chat, welcome. How's it going? Um, <laughs> Supe, I could do most things in 30 seconds, dot, dot, dot. I love it. It's hilarious. Um, pretty much I will once the design is more stable. Yeah, pretty much. Yep. Um, cause I don't want to get any, I don't want to write so much documentation that then has to change every time I change stuff. Right. Cause then I just spend time writing a bunch of documentation more or less. Um, once we get closer to a 1.0, uh, then I'll start generating more documentation for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my approach is, is definitely, um, an exploratory approach for this because like this is meant to be an extra a, a, a educational exercise right so we're experimenting we're trying things um and in some cases i'm deliberately trying things in here that i know for a fact aren't going to work but um we go into them anyways because we want to explore that pattern of thought right Do you think the reason I use NeoVim over VS is because it looks cool? Absolutely not. No, I'm much faster with it, actually. Editing with NeoVim, for me, has become much faster. Like, when I have to switch back to VS Code for editing, I'm so slow at it. It's not even funny. In terms of, like, moving around the file and stuff. So, yeah, definitely not. I mean, it does look cool. You're not wrong there. Um... Stopped using VS Code because some Golang plugin takes so long on each save. Oof. Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually, <laughs> funny enough, um, I'm actually writing like a bare bones text editor on the side that's, I'm hoping is going to be even lighter and faster than Vim when I'm done with it. But that's not something I'm doing publicly because I don't know how far I'm going to get with it and I don't want to detract from this, but yeah. Text editing has become a thing where I've uh, I've noticed how long it takes me to do things, and I don't like it. So I'm always looking to improve that, right? Okay, so all of our systems, all of our systems are taken care of. So I believe. Did I remove? The initial call to yeah I must have okay so let's go up here to my includes and oh we've got some things to move around here these belong here actually no they don't These actually belong here. Um, I suppose it's going to keep doing that, though, unless I take this and put it here. Okay, so I want to remove the systems manager, right? That's what we're getting rid of. I definitely feel like we're missing, we're definitely missing includes there, right? Um, so that's gonna have to change. Uh, let's see. Systems manager register, oh, I missed some. I thought we did Oh, just the last one. Okay. So, we have that, and then we have uh, engine states camera system. Oh, that's right, because I think we got an ad break right here, and I got distracted. Okay, so we can get rid of the uh, systems manager initialized. We don't need that guy anymore. And then this is the application boot sequence, right? So this is where we can actually start handing off some of that work that needs to be done post application boot. Um, and one of those things is actually going to be uh, spawning a window. 
So I guess we could probably do that first. Um, if we look at platform, I've made some changes to it as well. Um, so we now have uh, this window create and window destroy, right? Um, and so those work with these opaque handles, which are K windows, right? K windows are only ever um, defined inside the application layer. So there's a different definition for uh, Mac OS versus Linux versus Windows, right? Um, but now we have this sort of method to say, hey, platform, give me a window. Uh, so we need to actually go ahead and uh, invoke that here. Uh, before we can do that, though, we need uh, the engine states. So that's going to be this guy. Why is this? Why is this bleating about all these different types? Unknown types. Do we have our defines here? Oh, engine H has some issues. What is this bleating about? Audio, audio types. Audio types should be here, right? What are you on about? I wonder if that's just the IntelliSense failing. I think it is. Uh, but those two should be the opposite order, for one thing. Um, hmm. Font system. Why does engine H need the font system? What are we doing with fonts at this level? Ooh, our application config, font config, okay. Well, first of all, the application config should not exist here. The application config should be defined by the application, right? Um, this is technically an engine config. And an engine config doesn't really need to know about the font system config? Oh, and we have render view stuff in here. That's long been gone. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. I'm going to get rid of font config out of here too. Um, we do need the renderer plugin. We do need the audio plugin because the application does fill those out. We need to come up with a better way of handling that too. Um, handle this better than via app config. Because that's kind of rubbish too. Um, frame allocator size. Yeah. Okay. And then we also have like window starting positions, right? Which was fine when we have one window, but what if we need multiple windows, right? So I'm actually going to get rid of these. And if we need, if we need that, um, maybe we just say, hey, maybe the application itself should open windows that it needs. Uh, let's see. I hate when I switch text to editors and start typing to navigate. Yeah, I do it all the time. <laughs> I keep, uh, you know... I'll, I'll have like four or five W's that appear in, in um, you know, VS code whenever I have to use it before I realize what's happening. Or yeah, <laughs> slashes. Yep. hundred percent. Unable to write in another text editor. Yeah, I get that. Um, why type def that struct and give it the same name? Uh, because if I have a um, a sort of self-referenced struct, I can have that be the same name, right? So um, let's see. I think I actually have an example of this in, was it in here? 
I'm trying to think of where I had um, an example of where I had one that sort of referenced the structure type of itself. Um, so in other words, I, I could just make one real quick. Let me get rid of this. So um, if I had this, right? Then I can also have in here um, that, right? Instead of having to have that. That's basically why. Yeah, that's basically the reason. Uh, Laurie, uh, thank you for the uh, Prime subscription. I appreciate that. And the follow. Appreciate that. Thank you. Welcome. Um, yeah, that's really the only reason. It's just like a preference thing. I haven't found any downside to doing it yet, anyway. Uh, okay, so in here... Oh, I need to update that. In here... Let's see, what else do we have in here? Frame allocator size... Okay, that's fine. App frame data size. Application specific frame data. Okay. So those should be fine to leave there. I don't understand why this is here. Systems manager state. I don't understand that. I don't I don't feel like I need that. Um Okay, and a lot of these other things, it's like it's not finding my K API because I think we're just not at a point where it's building yet. So I think it's just bleating about a lot of that stuff until I actually get it built. Um, because I don't think I don't think defines H actually has any issues in it. It doesn't. Okay. Um. Let's build this real fast. I know it's not going to complete building, but we might get a little bit further. Okay, so audio system not found. I'm not completely surprised about that. Um, what I don't get is why when it auto added these, it did it this way without doing like uh, systems right so we should be able to just oops right um, that should fix that what did I Oh, let's try that again. Um, <laughs> did your, uh, let's see. Oh, because, uh, I guess. The Autobot did not like the term shitpost, which I don't have a problem with it, but, you know, I have to manually allow the things through. Um, can you share your NVIM config on Windows? Yeah, I can do one better, actually. Uh, so, if you go to that site there, um, that will give you um, a article that I wrote that details my NeoVim configuration. Um as well as uh, give you a link to the actual config. Uh, let's see. Roman, good to see you. <laughs> Roman General 23. Uh, loving the engine. Nice. Appreciate that. Thank you. How are you doing tonight? Uh, let's see. <laughs> yeah, cell phone. That's exactly it. Like... 
when I put on the auto mod, like I have to just like manually like allow all of the the stuff through, right? Um, because there are some things that I don't necessarily want to allow through, but it's like overzealous at the point at the first until I like get it to, you know, until I until I sort of train it for lack of a better term. All right, um, so. Let's see. Memory system config. Looks like we got a bunch of things going on here. I think some of these types don't actually exist, which is part of the problem. So, must use struct to refer to systems manager state. Oh, did I not? Did I not do that? I thought I did. Oh, right. This. It's bleating about. Because that doesn't exist anymore. I'm going to get rid of that guy. Uh, linear allocator. Like, all of this stuff, though, we should have references to. So, let's try that again. Okay, so... Xform system config. So line 376. What is it bleating about here? Oh, does that not exist? Oh, that might be why. Uh, we don't have... Uh, X form. My IntelliSense really does not like all this refactoring that I'm doing. It's really just completely pooping itself. All right. Um, font system initialize. Okay, so we need font system, material system. Let's do those two first. So we need uh, include systems, oops, double quote, systems font system dot h and include systems um, material system dot h. Um, Let's see, do we have texture system in here? I know that's another one we're going to need. Uh, geometry system, I think, is another one. Let's, um, let's actually do... Let's see. Camera system was the thing. Um, light system was the thing. So far that gets us. Okay. System manager state. Okay, I have more of that stuff to strip out. That's fine. Um, actually, it looks like all systems manager stuff. Okay. So, uh, let's see. So we have post boot initialized. We no longer need this. Um, Didn't we? I thought I already deleted that. I guess not, though. Okay. So we can get rid of that. Um, okay. 
So time light state we can actually get uh, directly from engine state timeline, right? Um, in fact, actually, why am I doing this? What do I need timeline state for, actually? Let's get rid of that. Uh, update systems. Let's get rid of that for now. Uh, to do, update systems here that need them, right? Uh, this is gonna be engine state timeline. All right, so we do that. Um, okay, so to do frame prepare for systems that need it, which I don't think there were a whole lot of those. Uh, so we've got that. Um, shut down all systems. Okay, so this is going to be a tall order as well. Uh, shut down. Right. Um, which theoretically we could actually just essentially copy the list from from further up. Reverse the order of it. And then just call shutdown on all that stuff. Let's see. Uh, your LSP doesn't suggest fixes. Normally it does, but because of all the moving around I've done, it's like it's like pooping itself at the moment. So yeah, ordinarily it does, but. Uh, okay, I'm ch Chainsaw. First time chat, welcome. Uh, the cherry red is hard to read for, for me. You mean the uh, the to-do text? Is that what you mean? <laughs> Fisher dealer, come to Brazil. I have a lot of Brazilians in, in chat, actually. Um, although my, my two normal Brazilians aren't here. Yeah, you're talking, yeah, you're talking about this one. Yeah. Um, hmm. Is it is it hard to read because it's just too dark red? Because like I have um, you know that color for note, then I have fix me, then I have hack, right? And they're all different colors, um, and then I have left off, right? You're an abnormal Brazilian. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, so I mean, um, so let me ask this. Is it a colorblindness thing that makes it hard to read? Just so I understand. Because I could look into different colors if you have like a particular type of colorblindness. I would, I would not be opposed to doing that. You don't think you're colorblind? Okay. All right. So maybe it's just this, maybe it's just this, uh, the black background with red text is maybe... Maybe an issue. So maybe I'll see if I can find um, a better color for that. Um, okay, so let me actually go to let me actually go to um, let's see. I'm going to grab from here and I realize I'm not going to need all this code. I'm going to need like 1% of it, but I'm just going to grab all of it so I have everything that I need in the order that I need it. All right, so camera system is the last one. Uh, let's see, shut down right here. All right, so I'm going to scope all of this stuff and basically going to keep one line and say memory system shut down 
right? Um, and so that's going to wind up being the last thing, but I'm not going to bother with the sorting just yet. All right, so we can get rid of all this. Um, so platform. Um, let's see. I think I don't think I need to worry about like unregistering all the console consumer stuff. I need, do need to worry about ads though. Bezos has got to get his money, you know. Not much contrast with the red, dark red on black. Sleepy eyes, it's a bit harder to see indeed. Do you know that for color blindness, the color combination is a challenge? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, it looks fine to me on this display. The thing is, I need something that sticks out against the background, the, the background, right? I basically want the to-do to yell at me, more or less. So I might, um, maybe I'll go with like a more of a pinkish, but then the, um, the fix me is kind of pink. So I don't know. I'll have to figure it out. Not really sure what I want to do there. Your stream is so chill. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> just solve all the to do's. Exactly. Yeah. Just. I'll just solve them all real quick and then they won't be in there, right? That's obviously the solution. Just just get rid of all of the to do's. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Trash can, how's it going, man? Good to see you. One minute and 30 seconds of ads. Yeah. It was an ad break, so. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um. Let's see. Okay. I think I'm caught up on chat. Yeah, looks like it. All right, cool. So. Basically just going to strip out all of the initializes, right? Uh, I don't need this, all right? So one of these, one each, get rid of these, get rid of that, uh, resource system, shader system, oops, those lines. Uh, let's see, job system was a little bit more complex. Here we go. Okay, I can get rid of that. X form. Font system. Initialize. Light system, and then I think camera system is the last one. All right. So now they have all those. These are all of our various systems, right? Let me get rid of all the extra lines here. Um, so now, uh, this is going to be shut down. Oops. Uh, this is going to be 
engine state. Uh, oh, you know what? I don't think I don't think the memory system actually has an external state. Does not. Okay. So that's our memory system shut down. Um, we also don't need all of the memory requirements. So two, three, four, five. So um, delete five words. Let's just get rid of all these real quick. Um, and then we also don't need we also don't need uh, Robert Dickerson over on the YouTube side thank you for the supporter I appreciate that very much thank you for the support greatly appreciate that that means a lot thank you uh, let's see <laughs> that code deletion hurts. No, code deletion always feels good, man. Um, actually, I'm getting ready to nuke these guys. That's going to feel really good. Uh, have you tried GitHub projects? Do you think it's a good idea for to-do tracking as GitHub issues? Better off than having in a text file. So funny that you asked that question, actually. Um, I actually was using slash kind of still am um, GitHub projects. <laughs> And I actually transitioned from that to a to-do file because I found the to-do file easier to manage, believe it or not. Because it functions both as a um, as a roadmap and what we've already done, like a, a quick view of what we've already done. I can just easily re reorganize it. I found it more cumbersome to actually go in there and create like tickets for all this stuff. So I still kind of use that for... Um, I still kind of use it right now for like issue tracking and things like that. But um, I think until release, at least, I'm probably going to stick with the to-do file because it's just easier. Low tech sometimes is much, much easier than than trying to be fancy with it. Um, easier and faster, I would, I would say. Uh, let's see. By the way, everything in the engine is m manually memory managed. Yep. Well... There are some things we've automated. How necessary is it to shut down the engine? I usually just nuke everything in my programs with exit zero. So there's been, I mean, there's a lot of debate over that, right? Um, my biggest issue with it is I don't always trust the graphics driver to release things properly on the GPU. And that's the biggest reason I do it. Um, and that's also probably the, the largest portion of things that need to be released. So it's like, if I've already done it there, I might as well just do it everywhere. Um, and it's generally pretty quick anyway. So I don't know. I, I still prefer to do it. I know the OS technically cleans that up for you. I don't know how much I trust that, especially when it comes to... Um, Specifically, uh, the graphics driver and audio driver, right? Um, yeah, I hope that answers that for you. Uh, let's see. All right, so we'll switch to all of these. Okay, and now we can say shut down Love all these guys. All right. And then this will be engine 
engine state console. Right, and actually I'm just gonna I'm gonna replace all of these and then go back and rename them. So uh, let's see. Kvar event input uh, resource shader renderer oops job system audio I really need to rename some of those to actually say system instead of just the thing. Timeline. Texture system. Font system. Material system. Geometry system. Light system and, whoops. Uh, camera system. Stack Overflow had a trust in video drivers. Yeah, specifically that's the one I'm worried about. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just don't trust it to, to actually do the thing. Um, because the amount of times that I have, especially in Vulkan, the amount of times that I have been programming something and actually had it like take the driver down is scary, right? Um, and so I think, you know, if there's still that kind of issue in there, especially like in Vulkan, um, I don't trust it to actually release the stuff unless I tell it to specifically. Um, and on top of that, um, like that's the whole reason I actually stream from a different machine um, instead, of, instead of streaming from the machine that you guys are actually seeing. Uh, is because I don't trust graphics drivers, basically. Uh, okay, so uh, we basically need to reverse this. I don't know if there's any quick way to do this in Vim or not. There probably is, but I'm sure by the time I look it up, I could have just done this by hand. So I'm going to do it by hand. All right. And so we're basically just um, shutting these systems down in the opposite order that we started them up, which should be fine. You know, theoretically, I could like add these to a list and then just kind of traverse that list. Um, I don't see the need to get that fancy. Plus, things could actually move around. So um, most of these don't have dependencies on one another. But there are certain things that have to be destroyed before others. Um, for example, um, like the camera system and um, the light system doesn't matter. Geometry um, probably doesn't matter. The material system does matter because there are um, re resources that have to be released from the GPU. Um, before that is actually shut down, right? Uh, the font system, same thing. Texture system, same thing. Um, those resources have to be destroyed before we shut down the renderer, for example. Um, so like timeline, X form, those things don't matter. Audio system, job system, like that doesn't. That stuff doesn't matter. Um, but a lot of a lot of these other, you know, graphics type resource systems have to be shut down before the renderer, for example. Um, the renderer. Hmm. We do shut down the shader system. This might actually have to be backwards. We might need to shut down the shader system before the renderer system. Maybe. I'll put it back for now. If we run into issues, I may have to reverse that. Um, and that's only because the shader system is mostly actually tracking um, uniforms and uniform locations. Um, but in an external way from the renderer, right? So it doesn't actually manage renderer resources. 
Um, and then obviously input you want to shut down before events. Um, shut down KVAR system last or close to last right before you shut down the console. Console right before the platform. And then obviously memory should be the last thing to go. Okay, so um, we have that sorted. How bad could it be to leave the GPU drivers in a bad state by exiting, making a game, um, and that could be an issue? It could be really bad, right? You could run out of um, memory. And I have actually seen that on, on Windows happen. Um, already happened to me uh, to have a Direct3D12 code running on NVIDIA but crashing on AMD. Yeah, I could believe that. I've actually seen, um, I've had instances where I'm trying to think what caused it. I think it was a bug. I think it was a bug in the NVIDIA driver at the time that's since been patched. But um, there was a bug where resources weren't getting released properly. Um, when you closed a window that had like a Vulkan instance open. And so it was just like leaking memory every time you did that. And so you could actually like go into the to the Windows uh, graph that shows the GPU memory usage, and it just kept going up and up and up every single time I, I launched the engine. So uh, to answer that, very bad. Um, very wise. I fought all week to get my GPU driver to do what it says it supports. Yeah, exactly. Some of that may have been an, a me problem, though. I mean, yeah, especially if you're using Vulkan. Chances are you're shooting yourself in the foot for sure. Rico, good to see you over on the YouTube side. How, how are you doing? I uh, really like your playlist for your Kohi engine. I'm writing my engine with C++ and Vulkan. And your stuff is easy and professional to follow. I appreciate that. Yeah, it does get um, it does get a little less tutorial-y later on in the series. Like, we kind of outgrow the tutorial format. Um, and eventually we switch to this live, live stream format. Um, just because, you know, when you're doing something as complex as an engine... Um, that's not going to fit the tutorial format for forever, right? So do bear that in mind. But um, it stuck. I stuck to the tutorial format for quite some time before we actually switched over. <laughs> for now, I'll stay in OpenGL baby land. I mean, even OpenGL drivers I've seen crash though, right? Happens there too. There's still bugs for OpenGL. And in fact, there's, um, there's bugs in OpenGL that can't be fixed because there are, there are too many applications relying on them. Do you use Volk or just the Vulkan SDK headers or something else? Um, so uh, right now I'm just, I have it statically linked, which I know is bad. Um, eventually I'll probably switch to using Volk and or I'll just load them myself, all the function pointers. Haven't decided which way. Um, I want to go about that. It's bad because um, the the Vulkan DLL that you are linking against is for the particular hardware I have on my machine, right? Which might and will differ from what you have on your machine. So theoretically, those those points exist, right? But if if you if you wind up having like a different version of the DLL that maybe has um, different um, functions available or not available, that could be really bad, right? Um, because when it goes to load those things, it's not going to load the right one. Right? So when it goes to talk to the driver, that could be really bad. You, don't, you generally don't want to statically link it, right? Um, I just find it easier for development. You were having trouble with just linking with the Vulkan DLL. Yeah, so... Um, the way you're supposed to do it is like the the way that you do with OpenGL and everything else, where you have a list of function pointers that you use get proc address, um, and you load all of those function point pointers, right? And and you're supposed to that's the way you're supposed to do it, um, and that's probably the the way I will do it at some point, unless I use Volk. I haven't decided yet. Um, the only reason I don't want to use Volk is because I don't want any dependencies per se, other than Vulkan itself. 
So I may wind up hand rolling it because of that. Because I don't want like tons of dependencies. Um, okay. Uh, why is it bleating about that? 528. Ooh, I wonder if... I wonder if this is broken now because of the change that I made to K-Info. I wonder if that doesn't like the inline function call like that. So I think this returns. Oh, wait a minute. Shouldn't that be... Do we not have K memory? We do. Yeah, it's right there. Memory should be freed by the call. Oh, all right. Well, we're leaking memory there anyway, so I probably should fix that. Probably should fix that. Uh, so, mem usage. Right, and then we'll do mem usage. And then we'll do string free mem usage. Okay. It doesn't like that either. What did I do? So we have this right here. What am I missing? Do I not have logger? I do. Did I bollocks the call for info? No, I don't think so. I don't think I did. Very strange. I guess let me let me do a clean build. What do you mean you expect So it expands out. Too few arguments the function call. Single argument state was not press. Wait. Oh, that's that's further down.
I don't see anything wrong with this, per se. Hmm. And why is it that particular one? Why is it that particular one that it's bleating about? Because we've done Right? We've done stuff like that. Yeah, it only complains about this one. Tim, and how's it going? Good to see you. Uh, let's see. Are these driver issues due to intentional obfuscation by the vendors or the fact that it's difficult to have really have a catch-all for Vulcan OpenGL. Uh, usually it's the second. Yeah, usually it's because it's difficult to have a, um, you know, a catch-all for everything. It, and, you know, Vulcan is still, for all intents and purposes, fairly new. It's mostly stable, but I still find stuff is broken from time to time. I'm doing good, Tamman. Good to, good to see you here. Uh, Trog, how's it going? Good to see you. Um, <laughs> did you hear about the XZ Utils backdoor incident? Yes, I did. That's pretty terrible. And also super advanced and crazy. Um, I didn't dig into it in depth, but I did some reading on it. And yeah, it's pretty, pretty insane stuff going on there. Um... Hi, just started your playlist. Glad to see the engine is still going. Awesome. I appreciate that, guy. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's. Uh, it's still very much going. Still has a long way to go. Uh, what are some programming projects you recommend someone to build if they want to build up a portfolio? Um, that's heavily reliant on what you want to do. Unfortunately, there's not really a one-size-fits-all, right? Um build projects that are related to what you want to do. So if you want to make games, build build a portfolio building games, you know? Um, and it's fine to start off with, you know, using like GLFW or SDL or something like that to build your first couple of games. Like, um, you know, if that's the way you want to do it, there's nothing wrong with that. But, um, you know, if it's if it's web development, build some, some websites and have those out there, that kind of thing. Um... Is it expecting message to be a string literal? It should not be, but it might be. Because I changed this recently, and I've done some testing on it, but maybe my change has broken it. Um, that is the... That's the only thing I can think of, though. But I'm pretty sure. Oops. Like this was this was the change that I made, right? Is to sort of just prepend this on here, which in C should be a valid thing to do, right? But it might not be because of whatever this is, right? Maybe maybe this is only valid with string literals is what I'm thinking. In which case, I wouldn't be able to necessarily do it this way. It's missing a comma. Yeah, I mean, the way that I was hoping to not have to do... All right, yeah, I guess I'm going to have to go back to the other way of doing it. So, the way I probably should be doing this... Right. I was trying to be clever and get around this. But um, what I think I really need to do is I'm 
that. Oh, wait, how did I have this before? That might have been it. That looks like it fixed it. Also, speaking of fix, ads for a fixed amount of time. Not an hour and a half. You know what? I'm going to look at that script now, though. Let me see if I can. Let's see. I'm trying to remember what I changed before to actually get that to work the way I needed it to. Oh, this might have been it. That might have been it. I don't know how to reload it though. Don't know if I even can. Run it quick. No, that didn't work. Right. So I will mess with that on the next ad break. All right, uh, so I, th I think this actually did what I needed it to. Because now I don't see that coming up here. So I think, I think that might've done what, what I needed. Yeah, I think that only allows literals, unfortunately. Maybe with a double pound operator and encapsulating it in another macro, could be. Um, I'm gonna try, I'm going to try switching, switching these all over to this. Ugh, that kind of sucks, doesn't it? All right, I'm gonna have to. Actually, I think info might have been the only one that was that way. So I'm going to I'm going to try that first, I guess, and see if it actually builds the way I need it to. Um Six ninety six. Oh, memory system shut down. Doesn't that need the state? It does. I thought so. Um, did we save off a We don't actually have a state. 
we don't have an external state for this. So this really should not be requiring any sort of state parameter at all. Um, K memory. Should probably rename that file too, but. Um, Looks like we're not using the state here anyway. So let's just do that. Okay. Memory system shut down. That shouldn't need anything. Uh, let's see. Should I use Plugin Manager to install the plugins that you set in your Neva? Packer. Yeah, I use Packer. Packer works really well. I like it. Uh, yeah, Trash Can. I haven't seen you in a bit, so yeah. It's been a minute. <laughs> Yeah, Rico, I think I had something like that. I had I had it done. I had it working a previous way. That might have actually been exactly what I had before. Um let's see. All right. So 715 and 815. Okay, so this is going to be systems manager state gets. Don't need that anymore. So the engine h systems manager state gets. We don't need this guy anymore. Which I know that's going to break stuff elsewhere. That's fine. Uh, 811 platform console right air. Oh, right. We got rid of that. Um, we just want that and We want the error, oops. The log level first. Okay. So now we've moved on to our KVAR system, which we've made a bunch of updates to as well. Um, oh, it's just our string freeze. Doesn't like the const being discarded which I'm going to fix that too because all right string free I guess we could do a we're not really changing the string itself right we're just we're really just nuking it so does it even matter right and we'll just discard it here because who cares that way, it doesn't matter whether we pass a constant one or a non-constant one on the on the uh, the external interface. Who cares? We're freeing it, right? Um. Okay. Okay. 
So I want to go back to the logger and fix that. Because I think Rico was on the uh, the right train of thought there. And I think this is actually what I had before. Um, and I, I was messing around with like several versions of this earlier. Um, oops. All right. So I think what I need is that. All right. And then, um, so we basically format the message into this. Oh, the only, I don't know if that's recursive though. I don't remember if that worked or not. I don't remember if that worked or not. Let me, I think I have this written down. Because I think, I think if message also has like arguments in it, I don't think it actually replaces all that stuff. Right, like it's not gonna recursively, and that's the thing I was trying to get around. So like one thing I did to try this was I had this sort of section taken out of here just to sort of play around with it, right? I was playing around with some stuff earlier today so I could test it, you know, sort of outside, um, outside the context, right? So we have, so really the issue here right, is this technically is a, a constant, right? So what we really need is like a, or it's a, a string literal, right? So what we really need is like that, and then we need that, right? And so that should recurse, and it doesn't. Right, so that's that's the real issue, um, and most of this stuff is irrelevant. Like most of this stuff here is just you know passing it through. Um, most of this is irrelevant. Those are just the layers taken straight out of Kohi's code, so that I didn't have to you know sort of rewrite this too much. So this was the macro here. Um, and maybe it was. Trying to think how I did this because I had I had a couple different versions of things that I was messing with. It might need to be. I don't know if I can actually do it this way. Right, unless I do. Because I don't think that's going to give me what I need, right? Somebody was suggesting that. Um, how much do you work on this off stream? Um, not too much, unless I'm doing like some sort of major like refactoring, moving code around that's like not really all that valuable to go over on stream, then I'll do quite a bit, but I try not to. Pragma ignore warning. For what? It's not give a valid pre-processing token. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, 
because I don't think I can do I don't think I can do something like what would be really ideal would be like something like that right I don't know if that's gonna work because I think that literally just puts message in place or whatever you whatever you pass it right like so I don't think that's like neither of those things are gonna work because it's already inside of a string Right, and what I was thinking that I could do was like that. But then it just literally puts message, right? And it's totally not going to like that. So I may have to I may have to back out this change until I actually figure it out. I know there's a way to do it. I just can't think of what it is off the top of my head. Because like if if message is a whoops, wait a minute. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So if if message is a string literal, this is fine. Right? If I do, if I do this here, and then I say, um, this, it works as you would expect because that's a string literal. But the minute I do. That is when it breaks it. They don't want to like rely on like any super new C features either for this. Resolve the message in the buffer first. And then pass to print. Yeah, and that was more or less what I was doing. I was just trying to get around like the double, the double print or the the double uh, string format, essentially, right? Yeah, that won't work. Exactly. With macro shenanigans, maybe you can make it print quoted message. Yeah, that would be ideal if I could do that. I would make a percent %f, percent %sf format that makes your print s, print f recurse. Are you talking about you mean something like this? Oops. Um, I guess it would be well, actually this would be part of you mean something like that. And then have these guys be var args. If you want to avoid the double formatting, you could just do. Well, so that wouldn't get me around the double format, right? Because there's there's a format to insert the trace and the new line around the message. That's essentially what's happening, right? And then the message itself also contains the var the variadic arguments that are passed here. Yeah, and I mean if I go if I go to if I go to do like recursive 
parsing, like that's pretty much the same thing as I already had almost. I mean, you know, more than one printf is essentially what I want to avoid, more or less. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to actually be able to do it. I may have to back that change out. Because I didn't think about non string literals when I was doing that, right? If this was just a string, it would work, right? But it's not. And I don't think there's a preprocessor way that I can do that. So I think it might be back to the drawing board on that one. Which is disappointing, but it is what it is. Can't win them all, right? Um, all right, so I guess I guess it's back to a double format because I don't see any way to do it otherwise. Right, so um, we would have to do a string format, right, destination out message. Um, we would also need a array of um, level strings which would be uh, let's see I think I had these spelled out here somewhere it's fatal error warn info yeah okay so fatal is first okay so as much as I don't like it in the effort to not spend tons of stream time doing it or trying to fix it. I'm just going to revert uh, part of this anyway. I realize that has a format string in it as well. Um, Right, uh, so that's info, and then we have debug. And then trace. Right, and so here I'll do um, the format string is going to be a string, and then another string, and then a new line. And for the arguments, we're going to have um, level strings sub level um, message right so that all format into that uh, what did, oh I forgot it equals here on top of my game tonight um, all right so that'll be the first string format and then we'll par parse the variadic 
arguments after that. And that should give us what we need. Um, over here, we also have these new lines, um, which I am actually just going to percent %s uh, backslash n. I have to double backslash that. Yep. And I'm going to replace that uh, with nothing. Okay. So I think uh, that's good. Let me go to change log. And remove that because that's not true anymore. Oak Spirit, thank you for the follow. Appreciate that. Welcome. Anyone have any debugging tips for Verilog HDL? I certainly don't. All right, so um, we're very much in the, well, let's see. Oh, did I, I, uh, I have a extra comma in there, don't I? Um, that seems, wait, log output goes level message for args. That should be right. Unless, me oh, info specifically is screwed up. I think all the rest of them are correct. Okay. Okay. So, uh, what we're going to do is I am actually going to commit this even though it's work in progress, because check this out. This is a list of all the stuff that's been changed. Who boy. So um, we're already on a feature reorg, uh, a feature reorg branch. So we're gonna say work in progress reorg. All right, and I'm going to push this. Um, and there we go. So at least, um, you know, if you guys are interested in that so far, it doesn't work, right? It doesn't it doesn't compile yet, but at least uh, at least we've got uh, a line in the sand, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a few changes we made, right? Just a few changes. And actually, there was another commit that I made before that, even that had a lot of stuff too. So this isn't even all of it. Like I said, we're we're doing a reorg. We're moving a lot of stuff around. Um, so that's hardly surprising. Uh, I'm also going to make a new session file. There we go. Okay, so uh, that is going to do it for tonight. Uh, I would encourage you guys to, if you haven't already, follow me here and over on the uh, YouTube side as well. That greatly helps me uh, grow the channel, and I really appreciate it. Uh, let me check on um, chat here really quickly before I end. Uh, as a hack, try casting the message counts characters, see if it works. Um, uh, that didn't work. I tried that, actually. Um, unexpected and rare bugs can occur. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I didn't want to really go down that route. Have the macro pass the parameters to a conventional function, then print each parameter one after the other. Um, yeah, so uh, where you're mentioning... Um, C23, yeah, definitely won't be doing that. Um, C11 is probably the newest I want to go. I think I might be using one or two things from C17, but I might back those out um, and specifically target C11. Um, yeah, 
I don't know. I, I'd still prefer to stick with, with C99 if I can, but I don't think C99 has the type of. Which I do need. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, that is something I'm going to investigate as part of this reorg, though, is uh, targeting a specific version and compiling against that, because we're not technically doing that right now. Which is one of the reasons where if you update to um, a newer version of Clang, it breaks. So I need to fix that as well. All right. Uh, so with all of that, um, we have ads. Dang it. I forgot to bat them away. All right. We'll, we'll raid a channel after ads. <laughs> Tam, a nice uh, profile picture there. I like that. It, it suits you well, yes. Pun intended. All right, so we have uh, one more minute on ads, and then um, we are going to raid, which I guess I can spend this time looking for a channel to raid real fast. I think I, I, think I know who I'm going to raid. Um, but I just want to have a quick look. Okay. So, um, just because I kind of need to, um, I need to sort of raid and run. Um, I'm going to be raiding uh, Ferret Software tonight because it's also a really good cause that I uh, like to support as often as I can. Ferret Software is a um, ferret rescue for ferrets that were in near-death scenarios and have been re rehabilitated and permanently homed. Um, and so the, uh, the rescue is powered purely off of the ad revenue for just keeping this channel open. So, um, not even having to like sub or anything, just literally keeping the channel open is, uh, enough to pay for the medical care, um, that these ferrets need, um, which can get quite expensive. Um, and I think it's a really good cause and I like to support it whenever I can. So, uh, that is who we're going to raid tonight. YouTube, I will paste a link over on the chat uh, side there for you guys. And, uh, yeah, uh, thank you guys very much for, um, joining me tonight. Uh, we will be back tomorrow night, uh, to hopefully conclude this refactoring. Um, and, uh, then be able to move on to, uh, you know, bigger and greater things. So, uh, yeah, thank you guys very much for being here, and I will see you guys in the next one. All right, and for you YouTube folks, uh, here is the Twitch channel for Ferret Software. So I'll see you guys later. Uh, bye.